Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining today's webinar in our Back to School series, where we will be going over the basics of the RPAG scorecard methodology. My name is Jeanette O, oh, and I'm on the investment team here at RPAG. And my hope for today is that by the end of this webinar, you'll have a better understanding of what the RPAG scorecard methodology is and why we believe in this system. The first thing that I wanna spend some time going over is what the scorecard tells you. So the RPAG scorecard system was designed to score funds based on a multitude of criteria, resu resulting in a straightforward 10 point numerical scoring system that could be used to monitor funds as well as managers. The scorecard has three main objectives. The first being that it helps us identify skillful managers. When we're looking to add a fund into our plan lineup, a really big part of the process is finding managers who can consistently generate outperformance. Especially for those actively managed strategies, we want managers to achieve strong performance, not just in the short term, but over an entire market cycle. The next objective of the scorecard is that um, it allows you to enhance your investment due diligence by allowing plan sponsors to analyze different asset classes and funds in a robust manner. The scorecard is able to achieve this by utilizing analytics that are more complex and in-depth than simple measures like returns or fund expenses. And lastly, the scorecard helps minimize your exposure to fiduciary liability by creating a repeatable and documentable process that plan sponsors can use to monitor their plan's investments. There are three main benefits of the scorecard methodology that I wanted to highlight. And the first is that the fund score is a single, easy to understand number that allows fiduciaries and plan sponsors to evaluate and manage their investment lineups. So in seeing just that one number, the fund score can tell us how the fund is doing and allows us to manage the plan's lineup in a very simple way. At RPAG, we look at the fund score as an indication of whether funds should be added or maintained, watch listed, or reviewed within the fund lineup. Funds that score within the watch list or review ranges simply signal that additional quantitative or qualitative due diligence may need to be conducted. And in the system, you'll be able to recognize those funds because they are flagged to show that they may require closer monitoring than those that are earning acceptable scores. Additionally, the fund score can be integrated directly into the investment policy statement. So by using those previously mentioned actions of adding or maintaining, watch listing and reviewing funds allows for easy integration into the IPS to establish a well-defined and repeatable process. And the third benefit that I wanted to highlight of the scorecard is that it could be used to easily identify those areas of concern. The scorecard segments the different analytics so that we're able to see what areas a fund may be struggling in, whether that be a style factor, risk return, peer group, or qualitative factor like manager tenure or fund expenses. So that's a very high overview, very brief um, introduction to the scorecard. Now I wanna spend some time talking about how funds are actually scored in RPAG. There are three main investment strategies or buckets that RPAG will categorize funds into. You have your active, asset allocation, and passive strategies. And these categories dictate what the most appropriate analytics as well as time periods are to evaluate a manager skill. So by breaking out these categories or buckets, RPG is able to customize each scoring system and create custom peer groups that, are, that allow us to have better analysis in our fund due diligence. In the scorecard, all scores are built on pass-fail analytics, where funds will receive a score between 0 and 10, 0 being the worst and 10 being the best. 
80% of the fund score is quantitative in nature, incorporating factors like modern portfolio statistics, quadratic optimization analysis, and peer group rankings. While the other 20% looks at qualitative factors where we consider things such as manager tenure, the fund's expense ratio, and strength of statistics. So the first category of funds we are going to review are your active funds or active strategies. And here we look at just a few key things. The first is that RPAG requires five years of monthly returns uh, for all of our, for those scorecard analytics. And the reason why we've chosen five years is because it gives us a really great sample size of 60 data points to look at. And that lets us know that the data we are observing has statistical significance. As mentioned before, the ultimate goal of the scorecard is to identify skillful managers within the space. And when we really break down what the ideal active manager provides, we wanted to highlight four qualities. The first is going to be style purity. So when we see a man, we want to see a manager stay pure to the fund stated objective or asset class, because if we're trying to diversify our plan lineup by adding a large cap growth fund, for example, it's crucial that we find a manager who is going to stay true to that large cap growth investing style. The second point here is outperformance. It's important to make sure it's important to make sure that we are getting what we're paying for with that active management fee. And so the ideal active manager should provide outperformance, whether that is on an absolute or a risk adjusted basis. This point ties into our next quality, which is that the ideal active manager is not only going to outperform their benchmark, but also rank well against their peers. And so with our active funds, we would ideally like to see strong peer group rankings. Lastly, active managers should have a long track record. This is really important because we want to make sure that the management team or the manager that's in place has been there for a long time so that we can confidently say everything that we are observing in the scorecard can be attributable to the team or manager on the fund currently. Some other things we look at in our analysis is that RPG uses industry standard benchmarks that are specific to each asset class. This includes the Russell indices for our US equities, MSCI for international equities, Bloomberg Barclays for fixed income, and many others. And one really important distinction within the scorecard methodology um, is that RPAG uses custom peer groups that are specific to each asset class, and in this case, omit passive funds to create a better apples to apples comparison than if all the funds were grouped together in one peer group. So those were our active funds. Uh, here we can see a breakdown of all the analytics that are used for the active scorecard. And I know this is a ton of information to look at. And so if this is your first introduction to the scorecard, I really recommend taking a minute to just sit down and read through all of the spe specific metrics that we look at, as well as their criteria um, to score, to pass that analytic. So um, for the purpose of this presentation, I just wanna focus on the left-hand column there. And as previously mentioned, the scorecard is broken out into 80% quantitative and 20% qualitative factors. Under the hood of that 80% that we look at, for active strategies, the first 30% is going to look at style factors. Earlier, we went over the importance of style purity, and our style metrics use returns-based style analysis to observe whether a manager is staying true to their stated objective, not drifting toward a different market cap or investing style. The next 30% of the active scorecard looks at risk return factors. Our second point on the previous slide pointed out that the ideal active manager is going to bring out performance. And so if we're buying into an active fund, 
We want to see the manager add value without performance, whether that's on an absolute or risk adjusted basis. In the remaining 20% of the quantitative portion of our active strategy scorecard is going to look at peer group rankings from a returns and information ratio standpoint. Once again, just wanna re reiterate that RPG is using custom peer groups that omit passive funds so that we can get that clear apples to apples comparison. And the final portion of the active scorecard is our qualitative section, where we observe qualities like manager tenure, fund expenses, and strength of statistics. With manager tenure, again, we'd really like to see that the team has been in place for a long time. For expenses, we just wanna make sure that we're getting a good expense ratio for our plan sponsors and participants. And lastly, we want to make sure specifically for those style factors that we have strong statistical significance so that we know what we are looking at in the scorecard is relevant. So the next category that I want to talk about is our asset allocation strategy scorecard. For asset allocation funds, a lot of the criteria that we look at are very similar to active strategies. When we're talking about asset allocation, what we're really thinking are those target date funds, risk-based series, balance funds, as well as multi-sector bond funds. So again, we have a lot of similarity between our asset allocation scorecard um, and the active strategy scorecard. And a few points here is that we still use five years of monthly data for our analysis which again is going to give us that solid 60 data points to evaluate these funds. Additionally, we're still looking for outperformance by the manager on both an absolute and risk adjusted basis relative to the benchmark. We still want that long tracker, track record from the, man, from the management team, as well as funds that perform well against their peers. And um, again, we are going to be using those RPAG custom peer groups to ensure that we are evaluating funds um, for that apples to apples comparison. And we talked a lot about um, the similarities between active and asset allocation funds in terms of their evaluation. But in terms of what's different, um, to start for our asset allocation scorecard, We've replaced or swapped out a couple of these style analytics to better evaluate diversification by the manager, which we'll see in the next slide. And then another really unique thing about this scorecard is the RPAG custom style benchmarks. For our asset allocation strategy specifically, we do not use the same industry standard benchmarks as we do with the active scorecard, simply because there really isn't one. No 2050 vintage in target date series A is going to be the same as another 2050 vintage in target date series B. And similarly, no two balanced funds are going to look the same in terms of their asset allocation. So RPAG is unique in that we use our returns-based style analysis to create custom style benchmarks using the four main asset classes, which are your US equities, international equities, US fixed income, and cash. Um, just also a side note here is that if you ever pull an asset class review um, for an asset allocation fund, you'll be able to see the actual composition of the custom style benchmark that we have for each asset allocation fund. So uh, if you're ever confused on what that style benchmark looks like, you can find the actual allocations to those four asset classes in the ACR report. Here is a breakdown of our asset allocation scorecard. And again, you can see that a lot of the metrics here are very, very similar to our active scorecard uh, with just a couple tweaks. 80% of the scorecard is still quantitative. We still have that structure. 80% quantitative, 20% qualitative factors with the same weights to style, risk return, 
and peer group rankings within that quantitative portion. Um, here, just want to highlight a few of the changes that we made um, within the style factors that's different with for our asset allocation strategies. And the first is risk level. And what this metric really looks at is whether or not the fund has the appropriate risk level for its style. And then the second kind of swap in terms of those metrics from our active scorecard is going to be um, style diversity, which really evaluates whether the manager has diversified their portfolio between equities and fixed income. The rest of the scorecard, again, very similar to our active strategies. So I'm just going to skip over that. But this is what um, we look at in terms of those metrics for our asset allocation funds. Um, this, the target date scorecard is um, a separate scorecard that I wanted to highlight really quick um, because for target date funds, RPAG creates a blended score. It's important to measure TDFs by both um, how the manager is alloc how well the manager is able to diversify their portfolio. But we also wanted to highlight the importance of the performance of those underlying holdings. And so RPAG has created a separate target date fund scorecard, which takes a 50-50 weighting of the allocation score, as well as the selection score to give you that final composite um, blended score. The third and final bucket or category that we have in RPG are going to be those passive funds. And now passive funds are slightly different from active and asset allocation strategies. And that's mainly because we don't need to look at such a long time period as we do for um, those other strategies. For passive funds, RPAG only requires three years of monthly data to receive a score, with the reason, with the main reasons being that we are no longer looking for outperformance as we are with those actively managed funds. And in addition to a shorter time period, there are a few other things that we're looking for in the ideal passive manager. The first is that we are looking for passive funds to track their benchmark well. Funds that stay true to their style purity um, and have low fund expenses given that we no longer need to pay for that active management fee. For benchmark tracking, and style purity, what we've essentially done there is, um, is that we've raised the threshold that passive funds have to meet so that the bands are a lot tighter in terms of the criteria they need to pass than, um, than we do for those active and asset allocation strategies. For passive strategies, we've brought, we've brought back those industry standard benchmarks that are specific to each asset class. And this time for that custom RPAG peer group, um, we are now omitting active funds from the space so that we get that clear apples to apples comparison. So here is what the passive scorecard looks like. And you'll see that the weightings here look a little more different um, from the previous scorecards that we've already reviewed. The same 80-20 split is the same. But you'll notice that we removed metrics like those risk return factors and replaced them with more benchmark tracking and peer group analytics. The reason we've done this is, beca is because with passive funds, again, we're no longer looking for outperformance and we really want to focus on the fund style purity, tracking, and peer group rankings from a quantitative perspective. Okay, so now that I've gone over what the scorecard is and how RPG uses it to score funds, um, the last lesson that I want to leave you here with quickly is why we use the scorecard and its advantages. So the scorecard has a ton of different advantages. Just to wrap things up, the first advantage of the scorecard is that it aims to find good managers. We are not just looking at returns, 
We're not just looking at expense ratios. We are looking at a ton of different analytics to judge how well the manager is doing and how consistently they're able to do that. Secondly, we're focusing on long-term performance. We're not narrowly focused on short-term performance, especially for those active and asset allocation funds. Uh, we're going to be looking at the manager's skill over the long run by requiring five years of history to score, um, three years for those passive strategies. The next advantage is that the scorecard integrates directly into the investment policy statement using that scoring methodology that we looked at previously. The zero to 10 scale with the watch listing, reviewing, maintaining, and adding funds. The scorecard also provides custom benchmarks um, for that asset allocation scorecard. And this is a huge advantage because we're able to really see how well an asset allocation fund does against an appropriate benchmark. And lastly, um, the last advantage that I just wanted to highlight really quickly is that RPAG uses returns-based style analysis. And so for those style factors and custom style benchmarks, we're using RBSA because it provides a better picture of how the fund has acted over a longer period of time. The final slide that we have here that I just wanted to leave you with are some resources that are available to you in the RPAG portal. The ACR, or the Asset Class Review Report, is a really great tool that graphically shows a lot of the scorecard metrics and can really provide additional color as to why a fund may be failing a certain criteria. You can find the ACR in Fund Lookup as well as in a client or prospect's investment um, or their plan card. And in addition to this report, we have a ton of great presentations and webinars that we have done previously that live in our resource center, as well as the Video Learning Center, our YouTube channel, and RPAG University. So if you'd like to check those out, you can find those um, within the RPAG portal. And lastly, our support team is always available to answer any questions you may have. So if there is a portion of today's presentation that you'd like extra clarification on, feel free to call into our support line or email the team at support at rpag.com. So that wraps up um, kind of the prepared material that I had. But of course, if you have any questions, please email our support team. Um, we would love to answer or clarify anything for you. And with that, that really wraps up our session today on the scorecard methodology. Thank you again, everyone, for taking the time to sit in today. And we hope you have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you.